So in terms of imagination, we imagined um, a couple of years ago that we could create the world's most power-dense, fastest-accelerating electric motor. And we did that. So we now have created a 35-kilowatt motor, a very compact motor, that can accelerate to 150,000 RPM in half a second. And with that technology, we have created um, the world's uh, first fully electric turbocharger that can eliminate turbo lag. And why is this important? Well, it's important to enhance engine downsizing and make most of the world's vehicles, which are powered by internal combustion engines, more efficient, going down from two litres to one litre engines and below that. And again, why is this important? Well, it's important because by 2020, something like 60 million vehicles per annum will be fitted with turbochargers. So what have we done? What are our achievements? Well, we've devised a new way to control electric motors. And so the electric motor we've devised, 35 kilowatts, that can accelerate as quickly as I said, is 20 times more powerful and has twice the top speed of the recent motor that was designed by, um, uh, by uh, Vitesse and sold recently to Valio for 30 million pounds. So that puts into context 20 times more powerful than that motor. So with this new method of controlling motors, uh, we can do things that current technology cannot do. Um, our first patent has been granted for our full electric turbocharger and further patents are pending relating to our control technology. We've raised 1.8 million of equity to date and also secured over half a million pounds of grants. But vehicle manufacturers like our technology and we're currently undertaking demonstration projects, that's engine demonstration projects, with global vehicle manufacturers that comprise 12% of the market. And these are paid projects providing us with early revenue. We also have a board with excellent commercialization expertise. The core is the new method we've devised to control uh, electric motors. And this means that we require far fewer switching events to control motor. And this means that we can control motors by the millisecond, enabling them to be more power dense, achieve greater acceleration, and importantly, require something at like at least 20% fewer rare earths to deliver the same amount of power. So why is this important? Uh, it's important because if you have an electric motor attached to an air compressor that can um, accelerate instantaneously, you can always combust exactly the right amount of air with the right amount of fuel to enhance the combustion process. Uh, and this means that you can downsize engines much more fully. With our technology, this means that you can, um, one, power air into an engine, and two, derive the power electrically to, to run that compressor from a turbine connected to one of our generators in the, in the exhaust. And with a supercapacitor backup energy storage device, you always have instantaneous power whenever you put the foot in the accelerator. No turbo lag whatsoever. So to summarize the advantages, eliminates turbo lag, enhances greater engine downsizing, enhances fuel efficiency, more to the point with always combusting uh, fuel very efficiently, we significantly reduce particulate emissions. And there are big legislation drivers behind this, legislation drivers to reduce particulates in off-highway vehicles and other vehicles, but also reducing the carbon footprint of vehicles, which we do very well indeed. Now, this graphic that you see uh, won't be of interest to too many people, but what this shows in essence is, with our technology, the time to talk with our technology, that is the time when you could deliver power, is something like 300 milliseconds. That is running along in third at very low revs. We can put our foot down the accelerator and in 300 milliseconds we get that um, time to talk. By comparison, a quite an expensive twin turbo technology takes at least twice that time to achieve this and twin turbos cost lots of money relative to our technology. So who are we doing projects with? We're doing projects with vehicle manufacturers comprising 12% of the market, and these are paid projects. We're also discussing other projects with other global vehicle manufacturers, uh, and also having discussions uh, with, with various people about what we're doing, and they want to know how we're progressing. Uh, GM Ventures, for example, GM know about our technology, they're interested in the updates of, of, of results. 
We're also engaging in an off-highway vehicles project for the same reason. Legislation is requiring the off-highway vehicle manufacturers to reduce particulates. And as we always enhance the right amount of air with the right amount of fuel, we do that from source. But why will our technology succeed? Um, manufacturers recognize that it is important to eliminate turbo lag so that car buyers will still have a vehicle with a smaller engine that provides the feel of a larger engine. However, a smaller engine enables you to meet legislation drivers in terms of carbon footprints. Uh, one of the top five global vehicle manufacturers that we are dealing with acknowledges that we have this very efficient control of high-speed machines. We have a very rapid instantaneous response, and we have a, a full replacement high-power full electric turbocharger. There are no other technologies out there that can provide this complete replacement to a mechanical system. Um, Tier 1 interest has been demonstrated, as I mentioned, by Valio's acquisition from, um, of, of the VTES system, which was this much smaller, lower power supercharged technology for £30 million. There are no technology challenges integrating our technology into a vehicle, and with mass production, we estimate the cost per vehicle being in the region of £200 to £250 per unit. The technology can also be applied in other applications apart from gasoline and diesel internal combustion engines. It can be applied with hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. It can be applied with gas-powered vehicles, gas-powered trucks. Again, the ability to always uh, um, combine air with fuel in the right mix provides a big advantage with, with the combustion process. It can also be used in other hybrid vehicle applications, in sports car applications, and so on. And we're currently looking at a, a micro-gas turbine um, range extender technology project. Uh, that's in the automotive space. In other areas, you've got applications in aviation and so on. We've got a very experienced board of directors um, that have experience in power generation, experience in commercializing auto technology, and also in financial uh, matters. So across the board, we have the right blend to ensure we're doing the right thing to deliver our technology, not doing what we shouldn't be doing, and doing the right thing to get our technology into the markets. And how are we going to get it into the market? Well, key for Aristec is we are not a manufacturer. We are not going to manufacture our technology. And what we are doing is we are developing prototypes and testing those prototypes with vehicle manufacturers, OEMs, to demonstrate the attractiveness of the technology. But then having demonstrated that the technology works, uh, the OEMs will not want to buy from us. We are too small. They will want to go to their established tier ones in the supply chain. So our business model is to license those tier ones in the supply chain. And we're already starting to have one or two initial discussions with potential tier ones. But of similar interest is the global vehicle manufacturer we're currently dealing with in the top five has also said they would like to introduce their tier ones and their tier twos into our vehicle demonstrator at the next stage. So as well as our looking out for tier ones, the tier ones we brought to us with the programs we're undertaking. And typical tier ones will include the likes of uh, Honeywell Garrett, uh, Robert Bosch, and so on and so forth. So just to summarize, the market for turbochargers, um, I said earlier, the market is expected to rise to something like 60 million vehicles fitted with turbochargers per annum by 2020. A 5% share of that market will be worth 1 billion per annum to a tier one um, approaching 2020. So it's a very valuable sector for those tier ones to want to engage with us. We have other revenue streams apart from the pure turbocharging side, uh, engaging with other fuels and so on and so forth. So there are other aspects of attraction for Aristec. And we expect if we just go down the license model as opposed to our technology being acquired, that if by the time we get to 2020, we've got the capability to getting licensing revenues of something like 50 million pounds per annum. So to summarize, um, We've recently raised uh, a funding round, completed that successfully. In fact, we were oversubscribed with existing investors following on and new investors <laughs> coming in. But we will be looking later on this year when we complete the next stage of our testing program with the top five global vehicle manufacturer to expand our, our shareholder base. So I'm interested in disseminating what we're doing and seeing there's interest in that. We are also looking, of course, to commercialization opportunities working with tier ones and others to take our technology forward. I think I got there. Thank you very much.
Um, you indicated earl earl earlier that you've got 25% fuel efficiencies. You're doing all these things with the tier ones and, and OEMs. Well, o OEMs, we're working demonstration projects. Demonstration projects with OEMs. How long do you, how long do you expect that to take before you have adoption? I mean, 25% uh, fuel efficiency, people should be jump, jumping all over you. We are introducing a new mindset, going from mechanical turbos to full electric turbos. So it takes a while for the vehicle manufacturers to see that the technology can provide that advantage. However, this is something they're, seeking, they're seeing now. And uh, one of the vehicle manufacturers we're currently dealing with has said, if we complete this program and we like it, we will want to introduce you to our tier one. And we would like to see it coming onto our vehicles within 18 months thereafter. So assume our engagement takes 12 months, maybe a bit longer. You then could see the technology in the vehicle, say within three years, if it goes very well. However, by that stage, we have already got the licensing agreement. We've got an upfront fee. But in many cases, if you're dealing with the tier ones, they will not want to, um, uh, to take, enter into license with you. If they see the, value, the, the volumes of uh, units being sold and exceeding a million, they will just want to buy the technology. So I would expect the return to shareholders to come far earlier than that uh, three-year period. Why have you just focused on the, the licensing model rather than generating that billion of revenue yourselves from sales of the product? Um, I think that's quite an easy question. You go to the OEMs, and the OEMs are very reluctant to engage with smaller companies providing uh, particularly higher uh, high-tech technology into their vehicles. They want to work with the tier ones they've been working with you know, over and over again because they trust them. They know they can do a good job, which is why our model is engaged through the existing supply chain, chain to see our technology adopted. I'm a, I run a search business. We've just hired two chief executives selling into the OEM sector. How are you, how are you organized to run a sales engagement program into a large OEM? Uh, well, you actually, in terms of the OEM, there are very few people that have a real interest in what you're doing and make the decision. So, for example, one of those people here today from Ford, um, Andreas, who I spoke to, had a conception about what we had, but didn't have the full picture. And I have said, actually, uh, and there was a conception that, that our technology maybe had issues that he thought were issues, that, which is why he wasn't interested. Uh, and going on from today, based on the conversation we've had, he is now interested in hearing more. It hasn't gone beyond that, but it's about engaging with the right people. So I've had conversations with, with GM Ventures and, uh, and Yernicke's colleague in, in the US, and he's interested in finding out more about what we're doing in terms of the OEMs. And it's presenting at conferences, and it's getting interest from the R&D people at conferences as to what we're doing, which is why we're doing the programs we're doing. Yeah, this, this is a huge deal because you've got a, a complex sale, multi-stakeholder engagement, long sales cycle, as a headhunter, I'd like to know, what, if I'm going to invest in the business, how have you deployed your resources internally to make that very complex sale happen? Uh, we have um, not had to focus much time on going out there and engaging with the vehicle manufacturers. There aren't that many big ones. There are, I mean, 50% uh, of the market has the top six vehicle manufacturers, and there are a few others. So you focus on the top six and a few below that, as we have done, and we are engaging with them because they like our product. If we didn't have that good a product, it would be much more difficult. But they like the concept of what we do, therefore they are interested in engaging with us. Okay. Nicholas, uh, you said there's a 5 million Series B round later this year. Uh, up, up, to five, up to 5 million, okay. and hasn't been determined, and it depends on what we're doing with our current test right. programs and so on. Do you have any fear for what further investment may be needed over the next couple of years? Um, it depends on what runway we see we need and depends on what additional resource we need to bring in. I mean, the, the issue is, should you actually seek to develop the technology to the point where it becomes to a very high technology readiness level? Mm. Or actually, should you step back from developing the technology beyond uh, a mid-level prototype because the tier one will want to do all that anyway, again, even if you've done it. So unlike Bowman, for example, we are not manufacturing, we are licensing. Therefore, it will be the tier one which will do a lot of product development work. So there is an argument to say we don't need that much cash to take us through that process. But you must have enough cash, and you also must have enough cash to 
potentially unlock other opportunities, which may be strategic. It may be gas-powered vehicles, for example, vast amount of gas coming available in the US. Are there players interested in using our technology to enhance uh, the capability to, to go big on gas in the US? And you need to have some resource to deal with that. Not that we have limited resource to deal with anything outside our, our main core. So it hasn't been firmed up yet, but, but yes. Thank you. Um, the question I have is, is about exit. Who are you going to, I'm not a who, particular company, but if you're going down a licensing route, one always has to be quite careful that you don't preclude yourself from um, a company who may be the one who you want to sell to. Of course, yes. Um, I mean, the important thing about licensing is it's always important to get your first deal because that gets you moving and it has to be on the right terms. We have to be conscious what the market is, uh, and some of the licensed partners or potential licensed partners will be those partners who will want to acquire the technology if it gets to a certain volume. So it will be quite interesting to see the route we go down. Uh, a good example of Valio wanting to have VTES as technology from, from control power technologies, they said we want this, we have to have it, and they bought it, there's no licensing. Uh, that could happen with us quite early on. But they bought VTES, so why should they? Thank you.